Good morning. Good morning. For all of the mothers here, and you know what? I, I was thinking the same thing uh, yesterday, and for all the fathers who have to fill a role in that regard too, and you know who I'm talking about. There's people that have to do that as well. We're just so glad to have you here. We do want to celebrate mothers on Mother's Day today, but most of all, we want it to be about Him, amen, and how awesome He is, how He lords over us, how He, how he nurtures us. And uh, I was thinking of the scripture that uh, talks about where, where Jesus is. He's like a, a, a mother hen that gathers us to himself. And you know what? I saw a picture the other day, and it just reminded me of how we are so there <laughs> many times. We don't understand even how much he does protect us and care for us and nurtures us. We take it for granted many times. So, so today, we're here to worship him. To honor mothers, but to worship him first off. Amen. So let's stand to our feet as we begin to have worship and praise and uh, just begin to exalt and lift him up because he promises us that he's lifted up. He would draw men and women to himself. So I pray today as you came in that you would sense the presence of a living God today. That you would sense the presence of the Holy Spirit and that you would be drawn to him. Father, we thank you for that. We thank you, Lord, that you draw us to yourself, Lord. Even, Father, when things just seem to be so out of whack, and it just seems like it can't get much worse, and uh, we look around us and all the, uh, all the stuff that goes on in the world, Father, but I thank you that you promised us, Lord, in the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And Lord, it doesn't go unnoticed. When we exalt you, when we lift you up, and you promise us, I've never seen the righteous forsaken or seen the pagan bread. So I thank you for that. In the midst of all the chaos, we do praise you and we honor you. And we thank you for all the mothers that are here today, Father, that we can celebrate with them. And everybody said, Amen. 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 God bless you. It's good to see you. Amen. Amen.
Amen and welcome to the Father's House and Open Arms Fellowship and happy Mother's Day. Woo! If you're a mom, why don't you just stand and let us give you a hand. Moms, if you would stand. Father God, I thank you for being such a loving, incredible God who allows us to lay our burdens down. Lord, we got to be real. We all came in with stuff on our hearts and on our minds, and it's sometimes very heavy. And it'll hinder us from worshiping in you till we lay it down. And just say, dear God, take it. Take it for this hour and a half. Take it so I can just focus on the Lord. And hey, God, we know you can just you can take it away. Or it might be there when we're done. But now we've got a better understanding because we focused on you. So Lord, help us just to lay those things down. Thank you for being a loving Father who says, just lay your burdens down. Lord, maybe we're dealing with before we blew it this week. Still feel bad about it. We did something we knew we shouldn't have. We said something, we acted in some way, and you say just lay that down to you. Ask forgiveness, it's gone. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Whatever it is, our busyness, our schedules, all those things that try to detour our mind from worshiping you. Lord, let's just put it down. Help us to put it down. Lord, I know I'll say I'll put it down, and then I grab it right back up. Just put it down. <coughs> worship. Worship you. Thank you, Lord. Lord, thank you for answering the prayers. Thank you that Larry's on stage today. Last week he was in a hospital. Lord, you're still working in his life. Continue to do that. Lord, continue to lift up Laura. Just her journey and the, this, the tough week they've had. And just continue to help Tim in that journey. Lord, just thank you for so many answers. Is. Lord, I just lift up Sophie again as she has surgery tomorrow and have your hand on her. Lord, you've done miracle after miracle. We just pray it for another one because you're an awesome miracle working God. Lord, thank you. Thank you for loving us so much. Thank you for moms. Lord, it's your design. You created mothers, fathers, family. So Lord, thank you for that. 
because it is the best way. It's the greatest way. It's what you design for all of us, Lord, to live out the plan that you have so that we can show the image of God. Thank you, Lord. Let us just worship you.
world on my shoulders. The only place we can find that peace is in Jesus. It's by using our privilege that we have to carry everything to him in prayer. Everything. Even things that we think, oh, that's silly. He doesn't care about that. Everything to God in prayer. Worry about nothing and pray about everything. That's what his word says. What needless pain we bear whenever we try to do it in our own strength. Whenever we continue to be worried and anxious and let that anxiety and stress take over. Instead, we can just carry everything to our friend Jesus. Let's sing that again. Oh, what peace. Oh,
You'll love the Lord your God with all your heart, except to your children. You let the Lord know that. And then this one. This one to me is one of those precious pictures of Jesus. Matthew 19, 14. Jesus said, don't stop children from coming in. Children like these are part of God's family. You know, it's real easy for us to hinder our children from coming to God. But if you'll commit this morning to say, I'm not going to hinder my children from coming to Jesus, would you just let him know? I want to give you guys a couple of things here. Is Alan here? Right here. that surrounds these families, God, surrounds these children, and also pour into their lives, Father God. Just support these families, support these children, Father God. Support Ryland, God, as he's always at the ball field, supporting his brothers. And just the way he smiles and the way he goes from person to person, because he's going to touch a lot of lives, God. I believe that. You see it in his little face. And his family, God, just thank you for their dedication to you, Father God, and the dedication to your children. See a family like this like come together around their, around their children after facing so many different circumstances in their life, God. You see them rally around each other and around their family. God, I know you got special things in store for these family, God. Special things in store for morale, God. And just again, like I said, Father, be with them, be with us. As he's tra trained up in your ways, Father God. And we just thank you right now. God, we ask for your hand of protection on his life. Wrap and cover him with your arms, God, and just always protect him all of his days. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this precious gift you've given Michael and Alan. Father, I pray that you grant this family love, grace, wisdom, strength, and protection. Father, protection in front, in the side, and around you. Father, as we know, it takes a community to raise a child. Father, I'm asking for your hand of blessing over each person who has a part in raising this child. Father, we love you, and we thank you in advance. Thank you. Amen. Now, before they sit down, church, maybe you've seen these families, maybe not, but now you have. And guess what? They need our help. So if you're serious about this, you're not saying it to me. You're not even saying it to him. You're saying it to the Lord. If you say, I'm going to pray for them. Say it out loud. I'm going to pray for them. They need it. It's hard to raise kids. Now let's watch some really cool videos of these two babies and their families. Thank you guys so much. John Lee's
And it's funny, not, not, it's pretty unusual for people to confess that they're not at church. You know, they just don't usually say that. But one thing I learned about giving out donuts, people confess. <laughs>
make their decisions for you. But we can live out some characteristics of Christ and live out some values and instill them in our kids <coughs> so that they will have what they need to get it. They still got to decide to do it themselves. We can't make their decisions, but we have something we need to do on a daily basis that has a future changing factor. Okay? We have to do it daily. Because if we don't do it daily, it don't get so easy. If they just hear what we say and don't see what we do, it won't stick. We got to do it on a daily basis. Instill it in their life so that in the future they have the tools. They have what they need to get it. To get a life after God. To get a life lived out that honors Him. So I don't know if you've thought of this question or not. I think you have, but maybe not in the same terminology. Because I think if you're a parent, you've thought about this question. Moms, dads, how can you change the care about changing the world. I'm just trying to survive in this family. <laughs> oh, really, how can you change the world? And if we're Christians, if you're in a room and you claim to be a Christian, you're like, not oh, hang on because you don't need a chance to be a Christian today. But if we're Christians, then it's our, our mandate to change the world. If you're a mom, your dad, it's also our responsibility to change. We, we change the world by teaching our children the Lord. And we teach them to then teach the next generation. And the next generation, and when we're dead and gone, we're still changing the world because we raised up kids to follow Christ. The character of Christ. Moms, this display of character. Dads, let's display a character of Christ. You know, God designed it the way he did on purpose. And I started to look at that whole story, but then God kept bringing me back to this story. But you know, God designed a man, Adam, and a woman, Eve, and he put them together as a family. And he put them together, he designed them in the image of God. God. Now that is so important that we get that because he designed them both in the image of God. He put them together in the family and he said, all right, now go have young ones. Go procreate. And what you're doing then is you're procreating the image of God. See, it ain't just have young ones. It's have young ones in my image because you're made in my image. You keep making them in my image. Which changes. Then, God said, hey, I want you to see my son. Jesus came to earth and Jesus showed us the perfect image of God. As he lived it out on a daily basis, because it takes every day we've got to live it out. Jesus lived it out on a daily basis. And then when he went to that cross to die for our sin, when he came out of that grave with victory over death and hell, he freed us to live out the character of Christ. That's our goal. Change the world by living out the character of Christ. Let's pray as we dive into his word. Father, thank you for your plan. It, it, it is the plan. It's the perfect plan. There will never be a better plan. But you created a man named Adam and you created a woman named Eve and you put them together and you called it family. And I thank you, Lord, for that. And, and you didn't just put them together as family. You said, you made it my image. Now replicate it. And Lord, as a nation, we really messed that up. And Lord, I can look at my own journey and say, boy, have I messed that up at times. So thank you. Sending your son the perfect image of the Father to forgive us of what we messed up. And then we just strive again to look like the image of our God. To live 
about the character of Christ. So, Lord, teach us through your word. Lord, examine us. Let us be real today as we look at just a few of the values in this lady's life and examine our life and say, hmm, what can I do to live out the character of Christ better? Zip through an entire book of the Bible today, so hang on. I was telling Kristen upstairs in the booth that uh, I've actually preached through one book of the Bible in five minutes one time. So we're not going to do it in five minutes, but we're going to make it quick. Uh, this lady who became a mother lived out some of the incredible characteristics and values of Jesus Christ long before she knew there was a Jesus. Even though she looked forward to a Savior who was coming, we look back to a Savior who came. She was looking forward to one who was coming and was already living out the characteristics of Christ. Her name was Ruth. Now let me catch you up to the story before we dive in. There was a man and a woman, husband and wife, and they, had, they, they, they were Israelites and they lived in Israel. And Israel was having this bad famine. There was no food. There was no work. And so they up and went to a country called Moab. And so they moved to Moab. And there they had two sons. And they raised those two sons. And those two sons got old enough and they got married. And they married Moabite women. And as time progressed, the dad died. Sometime after that, two sons died. So now there's only the mom and two daughter-in-laws. Now, in their day and time, they didn't have social security, disability, welfare, any of those things. You, typically, your family took care of you. And now we've got this mom who's up in age, and she is a foreigner in a foreign land, and she has no family to take care of. And she says, like, okay, now, the best thing for me is to go back home where I've got family, and they'll take care of me. That then released her two daughter-in-laws to be able to go back to their families where they were parents and fathers would take care of them and they could maybe remarry. And so that's where we come into this story in Ruth chapter 1, verse 16. So the moms decided to go back. She's told the girls, y'all go back home. Your commitment to me is over. But we jump into Ruth chapter 1, verse 16. But Ruth answered, don't force me to leave you. Don't make me turn back from following you. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. Wherever you die, I will die, and I will be buried with you. May the Lord strike me down if anything but death separates you and me. When Naomi saw that Ruth was the determined to go with her, she ended the conversation. We see something in the life of Ruth right here called commitment. She was committed to her mother-in-law. Now understand, at the moment that Naomi says, okay, I'm going back, y'all can go, technically, culturally, Ruth is released from having to care for her mother. mother -in -law. She can now go back to the life that she used to live, find a new husband, start all over. Culturally, legally, she's free to go. But she saw something. She saw a widow who needed somebody. She saw a mother-in-law who needed somebody. She saw more than that. She saw the one true God. You see, Ruth, being a Moabite, would have grown up in a culture that had multiple gods. It's just all kind of gods. But Ruth has found something. And look at her confession. Your God will be my God. She's found the one true God. And not only that, she even calls him Lord over her. Ruth has made a commitment here. A commitment changed her life and it changes many, many more lives. Moms, dads, commitment is so needed in our culture. Commitment is so needed in our families. 
And it starts with that first commitment here. If you want to be the best mom you could ever be, you want to be the best dad you could ever be, you want to be the best person you could ever be, make the greatest commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ that you could ever make. If you don't know him today, well, you need to, because I'm going to tell you, just making that commitment to live for him would change everything in your life. And it's not just a church thing, it's not just a baptism thing, it is a daily commitment. A commitment that you say, I'm going to follow the Lord Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, every day I am committed to following the Lord. It's a serious commitment. So that's our first commitment. And moms, if you don't think your kids are getting it, dads, if you don't think our kids are getting it, maybe we need to step back and say, How's my commitment here? Because if my commitment's not what it ought to be here, then I won't get it. But then that commitment not only goes here, our commitment goes here. Our commitment to other people. If you're married, you need to be committed. Committed as May the Lord strike me down if anything but death separates you and me. That's commitment. Husband, you need to be that committed to your wife. Wife, you need to be that committed to your husband. Does it get hard? Absolutely. Do they get on your nerves? Oh, yeah. Does it get us doggone aggravating? Absolutely all the time. Don't matter. We can talk all day about all the ills and problems and failures of our nation, but I promise you, I can bring them back to the disintegration of the family. Right. We need husbands committed to wives and wives committed to husbands. Period. No matter how bad it is. Ruth said, what happened? The Lord struck me down. If anything but death said. Ooh. That's serious business. Moms and dads, we need that commitment to each other daily as we try to raise our kids because they need that commitment. You want to bring security to your kids? You want to bring confidence to your kids? You want to bring a hope and a joy to your kids? Let them see mom and dad so committed to the Lord and so committed to each other. Changes everything. Everything. You know what? I never worried that my mom and dad were divorced. It was never a stress on my mind. If our kids are having to run around stressed out over mom and dad, whether they even going to be at home together and what they're having to face when they get home, do you realize what we're doing to our kids? They don't need to have to worry about that. Because mom and dad's committed to the Lord and they're committed to each other. They're committed to their children. They're committed to them. They ain't no hobby. They ain't no cool thing to do that's more important than my kids. People ask me, why did it take me 25 years to restore a triumph? I two boys. They were way more important. be committed to them. <coughs> Ruth was committed. She was committed to God. She was committed to her mother-in-law. God, no, because don't answer this. But would you be that committed to your mother-in-law? Don't answer that. Don't, don't turn Mother's Day wrong in a hurry. But we need to be that committed. Satan's loving it. He's like that war line seeking to destroy. We need this commitment to the Lord. We need this commitment to one another. We need this commitment to our family to death. So, you know what? That's a characteristic of Christ. He was so committed to the will of the Father. He was so committed 
allowing you and I to have forgiveness of sin. He was so committed to the killing on the cross. So when we're committed to death, we're living out a characteristic of Christ. And that, my friends, will change the world. So Ruth says, I'm committed. I'm committed to the one true God. He's Lord over my life. I'm committed to you, mother-in-law. And so they head back. They head back to Israel. They head back to Bethlehem and the nation of Israel. Only thing is, they get there and there's not just like somebody waiting there. Oh, we're glad you're here. We're going to help you take care of you, give you a house, give you food. No, it didn't work that way because Naomi's been gone a long time. And so they get there. They're going to need some food. They're going to need a way to survive. And so we jump story again, chapter 2, verse 1, long passage of scripture, Crystal was like, that's a lot of verses, yeah, that's a lot of verses, but hang in there, Naomi had a relative, he was from Elimelech side of the family, how fun did that name? Hey, somebody want to name their kid Elimelech, we dedicate him next year, Elimelech, he was a man of outstanding character named Boaz, Ruth, who was from Moab, said to Naomi, Please let me go to the field of anyone who will be kind to me. And there I will gather the grain left behind by the reapers. Naomi told her, Go, my daughter. So Ruth went. She entered the field and gathered the grain left behind by the reapers. Now it happened that she ended up in the part of the field that belonged to Boaz, who was from Elimelech's family. Just then, Boaz was coming from Bethlehem. And he said to his reapers, May the Lord be with all of you. And they answered, May the Lord bless you. And Boaz asked the young man in charge of his reapers, Who's the young woman? She must have stood out. The young man answered, She's a young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. She said, Please let me gather grain. I will only gather among the bundles behind the reapers. So she came here and has been on her feet from daybreak until now. She just sat down this minute in the shelter. We have to go back to the book of Deuteronomy to know that the Lord had set up a plan for his nation Israel. The Lord's plan always works and he had set up a plan for people who were poor. And that plan was that a person was only supposed to harvest their field one time a season. <laughs> You go through it once, you don't go back, you don't pick up what's dropped, you just go through it once. And then people who were poor, people who didn't have a field, could then come behind the reapers and gather stuff for food. The poor even had to do something, just not sit at home and get a check. They had to do something. And so this man, Boaz, is honoring God by allowing his reapers to go through once and leave the other stuff for poor people to come and get. And that's what, that's what Ruth is doing. She is one of those poor people. She doesn't have a way to provide for herself, so she's out there picking up the grain. And so Boaz is like, oh, who's that? Now, now, the guy says who she is, but, but notice what this unknown guy says about Ruth. So she came here and has been on her feet from daybreak until now. She just sat down this minute under the shelter. Now we don't know exactly what time of day it was. Culturally speaking, it was probably the end of the work day. That's usually when the boss, Boaz, would show up and pay the guys the daily wages for the work they've done. But we see a characteristic here in this, this lady, Ruth. A characteristic of hard work. She's been here since change the world, we'll change our families, we we'll want to change the love of our kids, let's teach them the value of hard work. I said it last week, I'll say it, you look in the Bible, God does not bless laziness. He doesn't. And we've become a culture that's slowly drifting away from the hard work. We're becoming a lazy culture. I mean, just, just be real. We are. And so we're beginning to teach a new value that is not a good value. We need to teach the value of hard work. And moms, that don't necessarily mean you need to get a 
job outside the house. I'm going to tell you, since our boys were born, Angie has not worked outside the house, and that lady works. She worked hard when we boys were home, and she still works. And when I was out working outside the home doing ministry, she was in the home teaching my boys hard work. And my mom, from the time I was in the third grade, she worked outside the home, 40 plus hours, driving boat, long ways to work and back. And, and with the help of my dad, she kept the house pretty clean and in order, and she had three youngins trying to destroy it all the time. <laughs> hard work. We need to teach our kids hard work. Our big screens, our computer screen, our phone screen, <coughs> you know what they taught us to do? So, to be sitters. We need to turn off our devices so that we can then tell them to turn off their devices and get at something. Find a hobby. Go serve somewhere. You know, we have a blast on Thursday nights down there serving people. We could always do some more. Bring your kids down there and put them to work. We got a we got a teenage youth retreat coming up. And we were telling them how could they raise money? And I said, let them find some job. <coughs> Hard work. Get a hobby. Do something. Hey, I got I got plenty of cars to work on. Come to my garage. I'm going to work. Now, some of you are going to relate to this. It took me a while. It took me a long while to figure out why my grandparents' furniture always looked brand new. They had it before I was born, and it still looked brand new when I was grown. In fact, when they passed away, we gave it. We, some of us took it because it looked brand new. Why? Because it never sat on it. <laughs> Maybe Sunday afternoon for a few hours. They worked their jobs. They come home and worked outside. They worked on the house. They worked on the barn. And they went home with, and went to the house and went to bed. They never sat on the stuff. A little flat wear out a couch in three months. <laughs> Ruth was there at daybreak gathering food for her and her mother, mother in law. And even, even the guys was like, she's been at it all day. She is now sitting out for that. You know what we're told about Jesus? He got up before daylight, spent time with the Father. You talk about some busy days. Just read it. some of his busy, hectic days being caught here, caught over there. We need your miracles here. We want you there. And then he had all this group that was chasing him down, trying to kill him. Characteristic of Christ. Hard work. You know something I found out? The days that I work the hardest, I sleep so much. Days I don't work so hard. Uh -huh. Maybe we don't need all that medicine. We just need to work hard. We hit the bed, we gone. I can't stand no more. And to change our children, to change the world. Well, Naomi finds out that. Ruth is working in the field of somebody that's kin to him. Boaz. And so she gathers her for a little conversation, and that's where we jump back into the story. Chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Naomi, <coughs> Ruth's mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, shouldn't I try to look for a home that would be good for you? Isn't Boaz whose young women you've been working with our relative. He will be separating the barley from the husk on the threshing floor tonight. Freshen up. Put on some perfume. Dress up. And go down to the threshing floor. Don't let him know that you're there until he's finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, notice the place where he is laying. Then uncover his feet and lie down there. He will make it clear what you must do. Ruth answered, I will do whatever you say. Now, we don't really understand their customs. 
Ruth really didn't understand their custom. But moms, dads, all of us in the room, we need to get in this last line of this passage I just read. I will do whatever you say. We need to humble ourselves to be willing to hear the wisdom, the godly wisdom of others. It's hard to raise children. It's even harder to raise them when you don't have the godly wisdom of others speaking into your life. And I may get in trouble over this one, but I'll get in trouble over this one. Because I have seen that moms seem to have a harder time taking wisdom from other moms. I think it's a territorial thing. My young man will tell me how to raise them. <laughs> Mothers, if you don't have another mom in your life who's about 10 or 15 years ahead of you can speak godly wisdom into your life, you need one. That's right. I cannot tell you how blessed I was when I moved here in 2010 to have Ronnie and Diane Stanley, to have Clay and Tammy Connor, and a few other families who were about 5 or 6 years ahead of me and Angie with our boys. I learned so much wisdom from them. They don't even know how much wisdom I learned from them, hearing them and watching them. We have to humble ourselves and say, I need the wisdom of that couple that's a few years ahead of me. I need that wisdom. Ruth said, I don't understand this. I don't understand about landing this guy's feet. I don't know. But I'm going to do what you said. Because you're a godly woman. I'm going to listen to your wisdom. We don't need most of the wisdom of Facebook, okay? I'm not saying it's all bad, but most of it is. And most of us people just spouting off what they're upset about something that didn't work. We need, all of us, but moms, you need for sure that mom is just a few years ahead of you. And you need their phone number. And you need a relationship with them. I said, well, I'm going to call nobody out. I'm going to call one out. If you don't know Francine Smiley and you don't have her phone number, you need to get it, Mom, before you get it. Amen. Amen. Because she's going to speak some wisdom. You may not like what you hear. See, wisdom don't always come the way we want it because we usually need it to correct some behaviors in our lives. Ruth just, boom, I'll do it. I don't know about you, but I read it. It don't make no sense to me why are you laying at this guy's feet. It don't matter if I understand it at the moment. If it's godly wisdom, I just need to do it. And we all need it, moms, dad. We all need it. If you don't have somebody, dads, you just need it. I need it. We need that first five, ten years ahead of us. Because guess what? They ain't done it all right. I love this man saying she'll tell you she ain't done it all right, but guess what? They've had a chance to learn. <laughs> Me and you still try. <laughs> Let's get that person who's learned and they can say, well, don't do that. <laughs> this works a whole lot better. So that we don't do the same thing. You know what? Jesus, listen to every word. Jesus was God in the flesh. Jesus could have said, I'm going to do it my way. No, 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 no. Not my will, your will. Even at the heart, even at the point of his greatest struggle, when he was there in the garden, he was saying, Father, is there any other way? No, no, your way, Father, your way. Jesus, the man Jesus, was wise enough to listen to the godly wisdom of his Father. Christ. Committed to God. Committed to those that God has put in our family and around us. Committed to hard work. Willing to listen to the wisdom, the godly wisdom of others. Well, how did that work for Ruth? Ruth chapter 4, verse 13. See, we made it through all four chapters. 
Then Boaz took Ruth home, and she became his wife. He slept with her, and the Lord gave her the ability to become pregnant. She gave birth to a son. We jump down to verse 17. He became the father of Jesse, who was the father of David. Israel's greatest earthly king was Ruth's great grandson. Talk about changing the world. Now, she had no idea. Just like you and I have no idea what our children, our grandchildren, our great grandchildren are going to be and what they're going to do. No idea. We can dream, we can pray, we can hope. We really don't have any idea. Ruth was dead and gone long before David came to the throne. But daily, Ruth lived out the characteristics of Christ. Not perfect. She wasn't perfect, just like we ain't perfect. But she lived out daily the characteristics of Christ. And they poured down from generation to generation to the greatest earthly king in the nation of Israel, her great grandson. And then, Take a little journey to Matthew chapter 1, verse 5. In the lineage of Jesus Christ, you will see the name Ruth. Talk about changing the world. <laughs> yeah. She was in the family of Jesus Christ. So, yes, Mom. Yes, Dad, it is. But know that you can't live out a character of Christ until you know that Christ is your Lord and Savior. You can't do it. So maybe today, your step to be that parent who changes the life of your child and your grandchildren and changes the world is that you commit your life to Jesus Christ. Make that commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ today. Christian, what commitment do we need to make to say, I'm going to live out the character of Christ my spouse, to my children, to anybody who puts in my life. Would you stand with me as I pray? Lord, I thank you so much for your word. It teaches us so much when we dive into it. See the life of a normal person. Just Ruth was just a normal person. She lived out the characteristics of Christ and it, it really did change the world. And Lord, we have no idea the plans that you have for our children, whether they're months old or years old. But you do, Lord. You know exactly the plans you have. Lord, you're, you're seeking for that next person who will be used to spark a, a revival and awakening in this nation and in this world. Who knows? It may be one of the children of somebody in this room. You're looking for that next person that you're going to speak into their life and create a cure for whatever the greatest disease is going on and that, that person may be right here in this, this room. We don't know, Lord. But what we know is we can change the world when we live for you. We live for you daily in our family. <coughs> so, Lord, whatever we need to do today to make that commitment to you and to make that commitment to our spouse and to our kids, Lord, let us be obedient. And live out a characteristic of Christ. I'm up front here. The guys are in the back. This altar's here. Whatever you need to do or to say to the Lord today, change the world your family.